Um, so today I'm going to um, discuss analytics in Postgres. And I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about it from the standpoint of not just using Postgres as a data store, but using Postgres as part of your analytics infrastructure and really your, your engine for running uh, predictive models. So the traditional way that analytics has been done is you have separation of the model and the data. You use the data to build the model, but the model's coded in you know, Python, R, what have you, or um, frequently it's, it's coded in whatever application language is being used for the, the application in particular. And the execution model for predictive analytics uh, data uh, for, the, for the models themselves is basically the cycle of, okay, pull some data together from the database or whatever data sources you're using, perform some computation with that data, and then make a decision and then possibly repeat the process as you step through a decision tree. If you notice, half of this formula that I just described gathered data. That's a data problem. And frequently, the data half is the majority of the cost that you invoke when you're running your models in production. So the main idea here is instead of bringing the data to the model, why don't we bring the model to the data? Because bandwidth, just network, network infrastructure, is one of the highest costs in any data center. And it's, it's one of your big performance bottlenecks. So instead of shuffling a whole bunch of data to your model, run the model where the data lives. So I'm going to do this in the form of uh, a case study. It's, it's, don't worry, it's not going to be some deep dive advertisement for my client. Um, but I did, I did want to describe this from a standpoint of a system that I've actually built that is a real world application and not something that's just theoretical. Um, so just to give you some background on my client, they're a financial company, they're a near prime lender, and really the, the key thing that you need to understand about that is that means the FICO score that all of us worry about, ooh, do I have a 720? Well, that FICO score for near prime, so people in like the low 600, five, the high 500 range, they're not quite as concerned about what their FICO score is. And that means that the FICO score is not a good predictor of are they going to repay their loan. So for somebody that's doing lending in that environment, they basically have to build their own version of a FICO score. They have to look at all the information about people applying for credit and make a decision on the fly of is this person a good credit risk or not. So having the ability to track and control their analytic process is absolutely critical. Um, especially because with online lending where there's no collateral involved and they're, they're not a car lender or anything like that. These are strictly, uh, they're installment loans, but you can think of it kind of like a credit card. So if somebody comes in and you agree to give them a loan, and in fact they were somebody who is intentionally trying to defraud you, you can have millions of dollars waltz right out the door that you're never gonna see again. And obviously that's something that a company cannot tolerate for long. Um, the other aspect of this is as a lender, they operate in a regulated industry. So they have to be able to demonstrate things to regulators such as we are not making lending decisions based on gender and, and things of that nature. And again, that speaks to the repeatability and the trustworthiness of their analytics becomes very important so that they can show regulators what they want to see and not come on their regulators, well, what do you, what do you mean you can't show me what, how you made this decision? What do you mean you don't know what model you use? So the um, addition to that, uh, you know, they need to be able to protect sensitive data, obviously. Um, they also need to be able to rapidly evolve the analytics models uh, because 
as somebody comes up with a new way to try and defraud them, they need to respond to that very, very rapidly. And finally, performance is a consideration. Um, a lot of the leads that they have coming in are done on a affiliate purchase program. So a lead will come in and they'll have a number of seconds to be able to decide, do I spend the money to purchase this lead or not? And those lead purchase costs can be very expensive. So by the time you get around to purchasing the lead, you wanna have a really, really good idea as to whether this is a good potential customer or not. So they have to do real-time analytics as the leads are coming in. So let's talk a little bit about traditional the traditional workflow in more detail, or as I like to call it, death by a thousand paper cuts. Except that now, you know, today's the era of big data, so it's not just a thousand paper cuts. Um, so traditionally, the way that, that analytics models are developed is you pull a bunch of data from a source system into some kind of uh, analysis environment, whether it's Python, R, SAS, what have you, everybody's got their own flavor. Um, or maybe you do some amount of searching for patterns on the source data system itself. You find the correlations, you build the model, you train the model with a subset of your captured data, and then you validate the model's performance on the remainder of the data. So if you have uh, a data set of, say, 100,000 loans and, you know, 10% of them defaulted, you want to you be able to identify what is it about the 10% that default. So you would run a sample set through the model of, say, you know, 20% of the defaulted loans and 20% of the non-defaulted loans. You'd use that for training, and then you'd run the model against the remainder of the data set to see, hey, does the model do a, do a better job of predicting or not? That's the analytic side. Then you get to the development side, or as I call it, throw it over the wall. So the model's thrown over to the developers. The developers complain about the code, possibly mock the language that the analysts are using. Well, why aren't you using Rails? Because that's the cool language. And then the model gets completely recoded. Now you have to test the new code, or you could just throw it out in production and cross your fingers, because that's always a, a good plan. Um, and then finally, after this entire process has, has gone through, the analytics folks get to see the real results of the model running in production against real data. And one of the issues here is this process can take weeks to months, depending on how efficient the organization is. As you can see, there's some problems with this. Um, first of all, data wrangling is not the same as analytics. There's two separate problems that are involved here. Uh, the ability to track models with this system is extremely limited. Basically, you, your only track traceability on the models themselves is whatever is getting checked into the version control system for the application itself. The analytics department may or may not be tracking their stuff, you know, and what they've done for the models. Tracking the execution, the actual performance of the models in, in real life use is ad hoc. It's, it's pretty much whatever gets implemented for each individual model. And a lot of times there is no cohesive system in the application. There's a lead model, and then there's a credit limit model, and then there's a loan amount model, and maybe there's some models for who knows what else, and, and they're all separate, and, and they don't know about each other. There's no commonality to the code. And finally, this us versus them leads to bad morale and massive cycle times. Now, to be fair, I'm, I'm kind of describing some of the worst of what this situation gets into. Um, hopefully none of you are stuck in that kind of environment. But even if it's not that bad, this, this kind of disconnect that you run into between the analytical team and the development team with this, well, we'll hand you the code and then you have to get it out in production, 
it's, it's not a useful paradigm, and it adds a lot of inefficiency. So the solution that we created for Kairios is based on recognizing that there's, there's basically four separate challenges in predictive analytics. There's gathering the data to construct the model. There's constructing the model itself. There's the model execution phase. And there's the data that you need to execute the model. But the commonality here is you've got two things that are data and two things that are code. So how we approach this is we said, let's look at these two problems on kind of on their own, but from a cohesive standpoint. We'll recognize the data problems as data problems, and we'll recognize the code problems as code problems. We'll use the right tools in each case, but we'll do this cohesively instead of, ooh, the data's here and the code's over there. So data, you want to make it as easily accessible as practical. Because inaccessible data makes the job of your analytics team trying to build the model more difficult. And ultimately, the data that they choose to use, that they say this has significance, you know, this, these data points here have statistical significance, those data points need to be readily available for the production model to make use of. If they're scattered all over the place, buried in XML documents or what have you, that impacts the quality and the performance of your production models. So instead of taking a point-by-point -point approach of let's expose this data point oh, and now they want this one, so we'll expose this one, and now they want this one, so we'll expose this one. We wanted to try and make as much of the data available as possible, as practical. So there's two main data sources that Kairos deals with. One is third-party reports, and generally speaking, those come in the form of XML. Uh, you go, you make a call to a web service, and here's your gigantic XML document that comes back. The other is the, the metrics on the lending portfolio itself. So the problem with the XML is that hand-coded XPath, like, that stinks. Have any of you ever dealt with that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all these sheepish grins going, yeah, it was, it was a horrible time in my life. I felt dirty. Um, you know, hand-coding all that stuff, and, and I've seen this from working with other analytics teams where they've got just these expressions that stretch this long, and then they need this for 100 different data points. So huge expression, huge expression, huge expression, huge expression. And trying to maintain that is a, is a complete nightmare, let alone the, the pain of actually creating that thing. So we said, well, hey, JSON's the cool new thing. Yes, we'll follow the herd into the JSON. Uh, but it doesn't take much thinking to realize, well, the JSON operators in Postgres make it nicer. It's not as bad as the XML, but who wants to hand code all that stuff? Um, so really what we did right from the get-go is we said, look, everybody knows SQL. SQL makes it easy. Yes, these are structured documents, or I'm sorry, they're no SQL, unstructured JSON. Um, but this is a, a document that it doesn't change, you know, so we can easily take the JSON and turn that into a set of views that represent the hierarchy that's inherent in the JSON document. So if, you're, if your top level has keys A, B, and C, and each of those is an object, you have view A that has its fields, and view B that has its fields, and view C that has its fields. Now when you're dealing with it from a SQL standpoint, all you need to know is how to join things together. And everybody knows that. So that results in data being accessible via SQL, very easy to deal with. The portfolio metrics, um, this, is, this is a different problem. So, the third-party XML 
you've got this well-defined structure and the third party vendors say, hey, you pay us five bucks, here's the data that, that we're gonna give you. They've already identified for you the kind of data that you probably wanna look at. The portfolio metrics, it's up to you now to try and decide what are the things in our collection of data that we've captured from our clients that could be useful predictors of different credit risk behaviors. Some of these are going to be kind of obvious, like people that just, they get the loan and then we never hear from them, well obviously that's bad. <laughs> so people that never pay, okay, that's one metric that we want. Uh, do people pay on time? That's maybe important, maybe not. And, and this is one of the places where the FICO score is not so handy because the FICO score is based on predicting, are you going to be late on a payment? Most lenders don't really care that much if you're late. They care if you don't pay. A lot of them, and they won't say this, uh, a lot of, and maybe I shouldn't say this since I've mentioned who my client is, and I'm not saying my client does this, but uh, you know, Discover Card and certain other folks, uh, you miss your payment and they get to charge you the $35 late fee? Do you think they're crying in their, you know, crying in their, in their, uh, <laughs> in their glass over that? No, uh, as long as you pay back what you owe them, they're gonna be happy. Um, so what this boils down to is you need to identify what metrics are going to be useful. Some of that identification can be done strictly as part of your analytics modeling process. I mean, that, that is part of predictive analytics is you look at a whole pile of data and you let the machine do the hard work of identifying, hey, the, I found this pattern over here. It, it seems to be important. Um, some of this is just gonna be driven by, well, look, we need to measure portfolio performance. So uh, part of that for a, a lender is being able to accumulate a loan loss reserve. So as loans are going through their life cycle, you need to be able to predict, okay, um, these are the loans that are okay, and these are the ones that we think there's a risk that we're not gonna see the rest of the money, so we need to start planning financially that this chunk of money is not gonna be coming back. Once you identify these useful metrics, you want to code them cohesively. And this is, this is an area where a lot of companies, I think, do a really, really not so great job. They look at things like tracking portfolio performance as, oh, hey, that's the responsibility of the BI team, or it's the responsibility of the finance team, and then maybe finance has to go talk to the BI team, and then the BI team might kind of try and complain to the coders that, hey, it's hard to get at this data, and somewhere along that chain, you know, things just break down. What you really wanna do is come at this from a holistic approach of metrics that are going to be useful for predicting things are probably metrics that you should be tracking and reporting on anyway. And if you now have two uses, you know, your business reporting and your predictive analytics that are saying, hey, we need the same data point. Well, let's just say this data point is important and we should worry about it all the way through the data life cycle. So starting with the customer interaction on the website, how do we collect information in such a way that we can do analysis on it? And that starts with everything from how are you collecting customer addresses are you sanitizing that data? Do you keep the original data that was unsanitized? Because sometimes you can glean information about things like, did they use all caps? Did they not use all caps? That may be a predictor. I honestly don't know, but that, that's the kind of things that you need to worry about on the front side. And by doing that, now when you're collecting data down the road, it's not this enormous nightmare to try and measure these things. It's not a problem for your BI team and it's not a problem for your analytics team. Um, finally, the, the performance aspect of collecting 
the portfolio metrics, um, that's something that certainly in the finance industry for portfolio metrics, you generally don't need to worry about too much upfront. And have any of you heard the axiom that the first rule of performance tuning is don't? That's what this is about. Um, so it, what you don't want to do is get all worried about, oh, well, if we don't materialize it and do this and that and the other thing, then you know, it, it, it won't perform well. And then you end up doing nothing. And now to calculate that metric, you just have to run a bunch of horrible SQL by hand, which by the way is gonna perform horribly anyway. Um, so focus more on getting the metrics defined, getting them implemented, and then where there's a performance problem, you can go back and address it at that point. Once you've built some infrastructure and you know, yes, this is the metric we want, it's a metric we need, and by the way, um, we need this report to run in less than 10 minutes, and we use it for the lead purchase, so we need to be able to pull the data in less than 500 milliseconds. The really important key part of all this, though, is everything I just talked about is, is built on this concept of bringing the analytics folks, the business intelligence folks, and development together uh, to, to define this stuff and work on it together. Now that, that doesn't mean all of a sudden you can't create a single data point without having 15 people in a conference room. Um, but you want to have that cross communication and most importantly you want to have um, a, a feeling of shared ownership so that it's, it's not this throw it over the wall mentality. So the second aspect of this is the code portion. This is the stuff I know you're all waiting for. Uh, so creating and trading models, that is frequently a computationally difficult task. Executing the models is usually not, depending on what you're talking, there's exceptions. Um, and frequently when executing the model is computationally expensive, it's not the CPU cost, it's not the computation itself, it's getting access to the data that the model needs. So if it's necessary, consider uh, if you do have a model that is very computationally intensive. Do any of you work with uh, predictive analytics with image processing, image recognition? One, okay. All right, work, work with GPUs. <laughs> Um, or if it's, if it's too expensive to run inside the database, you can consider using an external, um, you can use an external storage mechanism. Uh, obviously you want to avoid uh, duplication of code. And traditionally, this is, this is a big problem because your analytics folks like to use languages like R and Python. And developers like to use things like uh, Rails used to be hot and now it's more Node. Um, and, and you've got this dichotomy that, that doesn't really mix. Uh, by running the, at the, the model code inside of Postgres, you can let the analytics folks create the code in the language that they're comfortable with because Postgres supports R and it supports Python and it supports a bunch of these other uh, sort of procedure languages. And now you're not, you, you completely eliminate this step of throw it over the wall and let's rewrite it from scratch. So you want to, to support that, you want to make the model development environment as similar to production as practical. So what we did with Kyrios is every model has two database functions and that's really all that there is code-wise to each model is these two functions. One function is responsible for pulling all the data together. Now because we've got the XML information separated out into a series of views, 
the data gathering functions are really simple. Uh, it's, it's just, hey, here's a SQL statement, pull these fields from this view, join to this view, pull these other fields, join to this view, pull these other fields, just bring it all together. Um, and we bring it all together in a compound uh, uh, data structure, a Postgres composite type. The execution function that's responsible for running the model uh, can then be coded in any language that you want. And the only restriction on that execution function is that it accepts a compound data type and it returns a compound data type. The reason for doing that is that allows us to predefine here's the structure for this model for both its input and its output. Also, the framework then has these compound data types that it knows about and it can just store those into a table. So every time that the, uh, every time that a model executes, it just inserts a record into a table that says, here were the inputs, here's the output. Two fields, that's it, you're done. The framework doesn't need to know any more about it. Now obviously to use the output, you will need to understand what the structure uh, of that compound type was. Uh, here's, the, here's the credit score portion, here's the margin of error indicator, here's you know, any warning flags that we saw, whatever you want to do. Yes? Uh, it is a structure. So compound types in Postgres, um, the, the syntax is basically create type, give it a name, parentheses, and now you essentially have a table definition. It doesn't have the full support, you can't say foreign keys and all that stuff, but you say, here's the field name, here's the data type, here's the field name, here's the data type. And in fact, Postgres, under the covers, creates one of these types every time that you create a table. So if you say, select star from PG class, and you get those rows back, you can actually treat each of those rows as a field. And you can store that inside another table. Or you could treat the entire record set as an array of composite PG class. And, and if you wanted to actually code that, you would just say, um, here's a field, and its type is PG underscore class, square bracket, square bracket. And that tells Postgres, oh, it's the type name is PG class, and it'll go and look up and say, oh, PG class, that's a composite data type. I know what that is. And then the square brackets just indicates that it's an array. Um, so the, the model code that Kairos uses is typically a, py a Python function. So the model itself ends up coded as a single Python function. If you're familiar with Python, um, Python has this nice ability where you can define a function from within a function itself. So the more complicated models, you'll have a top level function and the top level function may define additional functions. But at the end of the day, the model itself is nothing but pure Python. And all that that Python function does, uh, the, the only constraint on that Python function is it accepts a single dictionary, which is the equivalent to the Postgres compound data type, and it returns a dictionary, which will then get turned back into a Postgres compound data type. So the, the database function, the PL Python function then, is nothing but a simple wrapper around the Python function. This means that doing the model development, the analytics guys, their job is easy because once they know what the structure of the dictionary they're getting is, they can produce test data, they can do whatever they want, and as long as they're returning the dictionary, that's their interface, and they can go off and do their thing, and they don't have to get, hey, Mr. Developer, 
um, I, I need this, no. It, let them do their work, let the database people do their work. Now, as I said, the, the key, um, one of the key constraints here is that you do have to know what these compound data types look like. And this is where you want to get the people working together again on this data problem of, hey, um, here's the data that it looks like we need for uh, this particular model. And um, by, by doing that in advance, what that allows you to do is you get the collaboration again going. So that it's, it's not, you have analytics guys that aren't necessarily database experts and they're crafting these horrific, ooh, this is how we'll pull the data. No, you get them involved early with the database guys. Oh, you need this? Well, hey, we'll, we'll do this thing over here and it'll make it a lot better. But by, by having the separation of the code, that means that integrating the code into the database becomes very easy. And in fact, we can do this. There's two ways that we can do this. So as models are being developed, we can create the data structures in the production system and go ahead and put just the data structures in production, not the models, but just the structures and provide the support for, hey, this is how you gather the data for the structure. The analytics guys can then take that, use those data structures, and actually we can create the data gathering function. They can use that on a, uh, a Postgres replica to say, okay, give me the actual data set. And they can, they can get a data set that could then be pulled directly in Python. So they could take a Python console like Jupyter Notebook, connect the console to the replica, they get the data streaming back in exactly the same format that's gonna happen in production, and they can do whatever they need to, you know, analytics-wise, operating in their tool set in their environment that they're comfortable and productive in. And they don't need to back and forth with DBAs or developers, hey, can you push a new function, you know, a new version of this function? The other option that we have is we can uh, give them just a snapshot and say, here's how you create the Python function, and you can now, you can just go run your model. So you create the function, you know, you, you create your model, you stick it in, in a PL Python function, and you say, hey, okay, here's the loan portfolio, select Python function, go, and that's how they can do the model uh, verification. The third option, because of this feature, is you can actually put a non-production model into your production environment. Now you have to be careful, obviously, that you don't start accidentally calling it from the web front end and all of a sudden bad things are happening. But you can actually do this to support your development and your model validation efforts to say, okay, here's the model, we think it's in its final form, let's load it in production, we won't use it yet, but once it's in production, on our streaming replica, select model function from all these loans, run, basically run the, mo the, the model against the existing portfolio, see what the performance is. All the same code base. There's no recoding here, there's no magic anything. It's all the same exact framework working from within the database. Um, so tracking, the, the way that this uh, framework works is the actual function source code for the data gathering function and for the model function is captured in the framework. So every time that you run a model you have pointers back to the exact source code. There is no question. There is no, well, let me see what Git looked like on that day. Oh, wait, we were doing a deployment at the same time, so I'm not sure which one we used. No. Every single execution, you know exactly the code that was put in place. The, uh, because of the composite types, the input and the output, those get recorded 
with the individual model execution as well. So every time you run the model, you know everything. There's no questions. And by the way, the table is not updatable and it's not deletable. So once the model executes, you have a permanent indelible record in Postgres. Well, a super user could really go in and mess with it, but uh, short of that, you know, this is a record that's not, it's not going away. It's not going anywhere. And you can show that to regulators and give them the confidence that, that they know now that, hey, you know what you're doing. This isn't, you know, this isn't guesswork. When, when you provide data to the regulator, they know that it's the correct data. Um, so all that stuff that I have been talking about, you know, that, that sounds kind of complicated and hairy, what does it look like in practice? That. Oh, but, uh, that's client code. Please don't share that. Um, unfortunately, I, I would love to open source this. Um, I am going to be talking to my client about potentially doing this, but obviously this is a competitive advantage to them. So <laughs> I don't know that I will be able to open source the framework itself. But I have given you the, the valuable insight here today of this is the idea. You know, this is how you can build a system that executes this stuff from within Postgres itself. And if the code simplicity aspect, so that, that seriously is all that you need to do um, to run the model. The, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, this, the, the kind of funny thing with null and then casting it to a data type, that data type is a table that stores the actual model execution. So every, um, every major version of the model that makes major changes to the data structures, it does get a new table created, but we're using Postgres table inheritance so that when you want to see, just show me every model run we've ever done, that's easy, you just query uh, model dot model run. Uh, I think there's a table, no it's, uh, Model.model .model execution, I think is the table name, but you query that and it's gonna show you every single model execution that's ever, ever happened. And then if you want the details for a particular kind of model, well, I want the, uh, the lead purchase model. Query the lead purchase, you know, call the table lead purchase or lead purchase model. You query that table, it's got the results. So by casting null, to the data type of the table, that tells the function, oh, hey, we're running this model. And the function goes and finds out, here's the details about the model itself. Uh, and then we just have a, a single surrogate key called identity ID. We use that to identify individual people. So that tells the model, okay, well, it, that identity ID gets passed to the data collection function, so it knows when it's pulling data out of the database, yes, hey, it's Bob. So we're running the model for Bob, so go get Bob's data. And then hand Bob's data to the model function that we were told about earlier, and the model function provides its result, and then the model run will ultimately provide the, uh, the actual record that's, that's logged for the model execution. So that's what the code looks like. Of course, the other question, especially for real-time analytics, is performance. So using just a very simple, um, really a do-nothing data gather function and a do-nothing um, model execution function, these are just test functions that we use for unit testing the, the framework, uh, you can see that the two functions take less than a millisecond to run. The important number is that other, which indicates that the overhead for executing the framework itself is just under seven milliseconds. So this idea that you can't run analytics in Postgres, mm, I don't buy it so much. Um, and unfortunately, I, I didn't think ahead of time to run these tests. I, I could have run these tests for some of the production models. Um, but in reality, using the real models, 
um, we're still seeing sub-second performance. So this is something that will easily scale out to quite significant workloads uh, in production without you know, causing a performance problem. So key takeaways, uh, use your data tools for the data, use your code tools for the code. Now this doesn't mean keep the team separated. You want the teams collaborating together, but you want them to be productive. So if your model guys want Python, let them use Python. Let them use it in its native environment, or R. And let the data folks use their data tools. Um, don't ignore this idea of using Postgres as an actual code execution platform. A more traditional way to do this would be, oh yeah, um, we hate all these things, you know, all, most of those bad things about analytics, you can say, well, all right, we're gonna build analytics as a service and we'll do service-oriented architecture and you'll make a call to the service and the service will know and it'll do all this stuff. And the problem with that is the service is still going to be shuffling data in and out of your database. So it's better, but you still have this data movement that becomes a significant performance problem. So use Postgres as a platform, Postgres as a service, or Postgres providing a service, um, and as I said, get the teams working together. And we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Um, so the question was, because we're tracking everything that's involved with the model execution, that's the input data, the output data, and the code itself, has that created a, uh, a data size problem? Um, not yet, because they're not in production. However, <laughs> uh, from a code standpoint, we don't store a copy of the code every single time the code gets normalized. So, so um, when we go to execute the function, we pull the source code for the function out of the Postgres catalogs. We create a hash, we compute the hash of that, we use the hash to look up in a table to say, hey, do we know about this? And if we know about it, we just say, oh yes, we're good, here's the hash. Uh, and, and actually, just to be paranoid, because uh, I think the hash is, is um, actually, the, the, the hash is the Postgres um, four byte integer hash function. So there will be collisions. So we don't use the hash as the key. We just use the hash as an easy, fast way to do the lookup. Uh, so we grab the hash. Once we use the hash to find the function, we just do a, a comparison of the actual code. That's pretty fast because it's just a mem compare. Um, so that, you know, C-level standpoint, it's just running through two arrays at, at the assembly level. And uh, then finally we, we say, okay, here's the surrogate key, uh, and we just record that with the execution. When it comes to the data itself, the nice thing about the Postgres compound data type is that it uses the same mechanisms that are used for defining a table. So if you want to know what the internal specifics of a compound data type are, you run the exact same queries that you would run as if you wanted to say, hey, what are the contents of this table? So that information is stored one time, and then the storage for the compound type itself is just, it's a Postgres internal format that's essentially just a stream of bytes. It's the same as if you had created a table and said, oh, I want to store this and this and this and this in the table. And then essentially, however that table would end up on disk, that's what gets stored in the compound data type. So the only disadvantage to this from a data size standpoint is we are making a copy of all the input data. Um, in our case, uh, at least right now, all of that data already exists in Postgres. 
the, the data gather function, which by the way, the data gather function, because we have PL Python and, and what have you, we could go call external services from the database. We're not doing that, but we could. Um, but we do have all that data already in Postgres. We are now making a second copy for every model execution. And that was an intentional design decision because going back to the regulated industry thing, yes, we could have set things up so oh, the data is, you know, we pulled it from here and here and here and here and the tables are immutable and no, we just said, you know what, it's not worth it. In this case, the bytes are cheap enough. We just make a copy, we store the copy. Um, and the important thing for model executions is in your production environment, when you're running the models, that table is basically insert only. You're, you're not, uh, if you were to refer back to the table, you'd be referring back to an execution that happened extremely recently. So it's all going to be in cache. So. Uh, so uh, I assume that that doesn't happen during model training. That if you're not storing all of the data every time you call the model to train it, or you are? Um, we are not. Um, we could. It, it really. We were early enough now that we haven't really, we don't really have data sets to do the model training on. So right now the models are basically, well, okay, this, we think this is a good starting point and then we'll start collecting data. Um, if we were to, to do that, um, we have two choices for, for running, uh, running the model as if it was up in production. We could either put the model in production, not call it from production code, but then once it's in production, um, we could run it, we could run the models by hand on the production database. Not a good idea. Uh, the second option that we have is if we create a snapshot or if we have a logical replication slave, we could then run those model functions and actually go create those records. Um, that I think is going to be a matter of what's convenient. To start off with when we first start doing model training, we may well do that because it, it may just be the easiest thing to do. Oh, hey, look, it's, it's, here's the code in production and just... There's your overhead. Uh, yes, yes, and, and, and everybody please understand, this was developed with a specific use case for a specific client in mind. We're obviously very focused on the regulated industry portion of this as well. So um, should you just blindly go take this model and implement it where you work? Well, unless you work in another financial company, maybe not. Um, so yes, if you are talking about this is a huge chunk of data, no, you're, you're not going to want to do that. Um, my experience in the financial industry is that typically the, the model input data is only going to be maybe a third of the database uh, in its raw form. But then in its compacted, you know, in its com composite key form, uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's going to be terribly significant. Um, the, right, right. So the, the question is, um, if your analytics folks are using something that there is not a procedural language for, could you still use this, this concept? Um, the answer is yes, because uh, you mentioned shell. Actually, there is a PL shell. So you could fire up a shell from in the model execution. Um, the, the one downside to that, now I wouldn't necessarily recommend shell. If you want to do that, what I would suggest is that you treat it as, oh, that portion of the model is a standalone service. So you use one of the procedure languages like PL Python or PL Perl would be two good choices or, or maybe V8. Um, 
and you use those to call out to that service and you pass the data to the service and then you get the results back and then you can, you know, for the rest of that, you can, you can do what I described. So uh, I'm being told we are out of time. I think is next the lightning talk? Oh, yes. Next is sponsor talks. So uh, I will stick around here for another four minutes, um, but then we all need to be next door. So thank you very much.